I think three big topics are women, servitude, and warfare in the Old Testament. Those are big ones, and there are some texts that seem troubling to a lot of people. And, and I think just generally you know, believers, too, can be troubled by these. But even beyond some of those basic challenges, uh, things like how could God command Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? Or does a woman have to marry her rapist? Or what about some of those you know, ceremonial laws, perhaps? Or, or what about those harsh punishments, you know, stoning, burning? Is that actually literal? And, uh, and you know, be, be prepared for a few surprises here as we, as we unpack that. Well, I, for one, am greatly looking forward to it. Ladies and gentlemen, you might notice that suddenly we are in a different location. We're at a new studio. We have an in-person guest, and it's the notorious, the great, the powerful <laughs> Dr. Paul Copan. Thanks so much, Brandon. Great to be with you. I'm actually ge genuinely super, super excited for the ability to sit across from you and to have this conversation. Um, lit literally last night, I was doing a live stream on an atheistic YouTube channel mm -hmm. and talking with those guys, making a case for God in general. And we were getting into origin of life, origin of universe, all of these types of questions. But it was interesting because the entire time I couldn't get away from this sense that they did not want it to be true. They did not want God to be true. Mm -hmm. And I I know that that sounds a little uh, like I'm psychologizing on them or something, but it, it really it really is apparent to me in many of these conversations that I have and when I read the comments mm -hmm. on even my own videos that there is um, there is an emotional psychological mm -hmm. um, reason to not want to believe when mm -hmm. you believe that God is, for example, a moral monster. And mm -hmm. personally, I can... I can attest to this because there was a time, as you know, about 10 years ago when I was really wrestling with the nature and character of God. Who is, what is God really like? Because if he's, not, if he's not good and loving, then there's something in me that just resists mm -hmm. wanting to bow down to him or wanting to be with him. I don't yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're right about uh, many atheists who don't have so much of an intellectual problem, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in the sense that it's, that's the whole issue. You know, there may be challenges they'll push back on, but, uh, but someone like Thomas Nagel, New York University philosopher, who, you know, kind of well-known, well-recognized philosopher who said that he was troubled by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people he knows are religious believers. He says, but he, he has the fear of religion. He, and, and it's this, that he doesn't want there to be a God. He doesn't want a universe to be like that. Uh, that so he's very frank in his admission that he just doesn't want there to be mm. a God at the center of things. Uh, but as you point out, there are other issues that go along with that. You can say, well, the truth of the gospel is there. The truth of the scriptures is there. But some people say, well, the truth may be good and fine, but, but I want to know if God is really trustworthy, if God is really good, if the, you know, if the gospel story is really beautiful. So truth is important, but what about the goodness and the beauty uh, that also should go with that? And, uh, and, and that's uh, an important conversation to have. The people, people want to see that God, that Jesus is good as well, uh, not simply to know that these things are true, that it's actually the fact that Jesus rose from the dead bodily uh, in history, that this is a fact that can mm. be supported and verified. So taking it a step further is important. You know, so, you know, sometimes I'll talk about, you know, the, the moral argument for God's existence, you know, that the moral facts of, the, of reality uh, point us to a, a good God. Well, they'll say, oh yeah, but what about the God of the Old Testament? And it's, it's sort of like the, all of that is bypassed. Right. And I want to deal with this stuff, you know, convince me of this stuff. And so that's uh, an important question to be answering. And I like that you just said, what about this? Because that, that's, a, that's a phrase I've been using a lot is this idea of like a whataboutism where you might be talking about topic A, yeah. but if, they're, if, if the skeptic or seeker's what about is big enough, then they, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, it's actually that thing on, mm -hmm. on the sideline that needs to be contended with mm -hmm. before you can talk about anything else. Mm -hmm. So that's, what, that's the reason that I initially reached out to you, given that you're just a, you know, a few miles down the road, is I thought, let's do you know, something like a series mm -hmm. or... Um, a bit more of a deep dive rather than just a flyby into yeah. some of these critical passages in the scripture that are people's whatabouts. It would be amazing to, you know, create a library of content, a library of videos where if someone says, yeah, but what about this story or this verse or this passage, to be able to say, 
so glad you brought that up. Here's, you know, a, a portion of a conversation that's a part of a bigger conversation, but it's a video that just addresses that particular narrative uh, issue that a, that a person has. So that's kind of what we're hoping to do, you know, over, over time is to be able to address some of those things. But for today, I think that it would be helpful to give just a little bit more context. So your book is titled, Is God a Moral Monster? Right. And so I know that the titles, the chapter titles, and actually the title of the book are referencing the language of Richard Dawkins. Is that right? Yeah, Richard Dawkins and other new atheists like Sam Harris, mm -hmm. Daniel Dennett. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm unpacking a lot of the, the challenges that they uh, will raise uh, using their slogans about the Old Testament God uh, as my chapter headings. Uh, so uh, Richard Dawkins said the Old Testament God is the most unpleasant character in all of fiction, and so has a whole long description about uh, what he finds problematic about the God of the Old Testament. So, but yeah, that's my my basic approach there to to address some of the challenges they raise, but also to go into some depth on 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 these issues, giving some background context and so forth. I've been reading a couple different things more recently about how some of the gravitas of the new atheist movement is is actually fading, and that the relevancy of that is 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 also waning, and that I guess people just have not been as fully satisfied with yeah. the conclusions. But I still think I, I would hear your thought on that, and I, I I was just also leading in there to say that I think that it is still vitally important to look at what their criticisms were mm -hmm. and for the titles of your books to still be related to that. Mm -hmm. I still see the effects of it all the time, for example, in the comments section. I still think that these are huge, huge topics to tackle. But would you agree? Or Do you know what I'm talking about? This? Oh, yeah, like, totally. So, so tell me a little bit more about this. Yeah. Well, there's a recent book co-edited by Alistair McGrath. Uh, it's called Coming to Faith through Richard Dawkins. And it basically refers to people who, and people who are writing about how they had been attracted to Richard Dawkins and his strong claims in defense of atheism, but realizing that it was like a paper tiger, that a lot of these claims that were being made were simply well, distortions. And also there's a, a, an unwillingness by Richard Dawkins and other new atheists that came in, in the wake of September 11th, uh, an unwillingness to actually engage in arguments. There's just a lot of rhetoric uh, involved. I had a chance to ask Richard Dawkins this question when he was speaking here at Nova Southeastern University, and I asked him about, and I said, if, if we're simply controlled by our, uh, you know, we're just dancing to the music of our DNA, as he says, if, if, you know, then why think that atheism is more rational than theism if both the atheist and the theist believe what they do based on physical forces over which they have no control. You can't control the sorts of physical processes that are producing your thoughts, so why well, think that one view is more rational than another? And he said, well, because science works. And then he went on to say, this is his kind of closing argument, besides science flies rockets to the moon, but religion flies planes into buildings. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Muslim terrorists couldn't help doing what they were doing because they were just dancing to the music of their DNA. So on the one hand, he says that there is no good or evil, but then he says, oh, but those Muslim terrorists were evil. Uh, they were you know, flying planes into buildings. Well, they couldn't help doing what they're doing, according to Richard Dawkins' own worldview. So, so again, that's the kind of you know, you know, rhetoric that he uses to kind of throw people off course. So he'll talk about morality on the one hand, but then say, no, there is no morality. Uh, he'll, he'll say that we're dancing the music of our DNA, but then he'll say, oh, but they were exerting their free will. They should have known better. Well, you can't have it both ways. And, and that's one of the problems, just that rhetorical stuff that he just doesn't really engage with the argument. And that's been a problem. A lot of critics, and, and again, this book by co-edited by Alice McGrath, point out mm -hmm. that there's, you know, a lot of people have been just disillusioned by the new atheist movement. Uh, I mean, one, one person, Michael Roos, he said, Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, makes me embarrassed to be an atheist. Mm. So he makes, he just recognizes that there's just a lot of rhetoric, but no real substance involved in these new atheist arguments. I do feel like there is shrapnel from that movement. And I think that because humans desire something more than a purely materialist model, what has happened though, is that people have taken away from that, that, they're, that they don't like this biblical God. Mm -hmm. 
but they also don't like the purely materialist model. Right. So now it's more and more so the case that there's this cafeteria approach because we can't get away from our inescapable desire for something more. This is even why I'm like, why are Ouija boards a thing? And why do people have this mm -hmm. just, oh, wouldn't that be crazy? What if it moved? What if there was, and we, we love ghost stories. We love like the numinous unless it's God. And I, and I always, like, that is, always fascinates me. Mm -hmm. what it, why, are, why is there so much skepticism and so much resistance to the biblical God, but so much openness and curiosity mm -hmm. to the generally spiritual? Mm -hmm. And I think that it has something to do with that idea of authority, but I also think it has something to do with the idea of, is, is God good? I want to deal with those hard questions, mm -hmm. because I think that if people can, can rethink some concept that they might have of mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. that may have more cultural baggage in it than a, a genuine portrait of who God is. So so one of my mm -hmm. big claims is that if you if you don't want Christianity to be true, you don't rightly understand it. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. I, I really believe that if you rightly understand yourself and your human nature, and you rightly understand the, the character and nature of God, yeah. and you need both of those pieces, because one requires humility and the other yeah. requires acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have both of those pieces in place, you will be so excited by mm -hmm. who God is and what mm -hmm. God has done for us. So for me, it's like, let's look at mm -hmm. the, at those aspects. Yeah. No, you're right. And, and one of the things that I am very concerned about doing is to bring the Old Testament and New Testament portrayals of God together, which is what I do in my more recent book, Is God a Vindictive Bully? Uh, and one of the things that is very powerful about Jesus is he just comes on the scene with a presumed authority and he expects people to listen to him, to obey him. And of course, if something like the resurrection is a historical fact, it's not just something that's of historical interest to historians, but this is something that makes an impact on my life. It challenges me. Uh, I remember hearing the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright saying, Jesus scares me to death. Uh, he's someone who challenges me. He's someone who does not make my life comfortable. Uh, but you're right. If Jesus is who he says he is, we find that on the one hand, uh, he, you know, he'll turn over tables in the temple. And, you know, we actually want a, a, a savior who will turn over temples, who will, who will push away injustice, who will deal with the unjust and, the, and, and those who have no concern for the oppressed and, and dehumanized. You know, but on the other hand, Jesus says, come to me, you are weary, I'll give you rest. That Jesus is one who comes to quench the, the deepest longings of our heart, that he will break, give the water of life to us. He is the bread of life and so forth. So you see both of those things, that Jesus who is commanding our authority, but also one, if we put our trust in him, we find rest, peace, and joy. So with that as a hopefully really beautiful uh, carrot on a string <laughs> w w that we want to ultimately get to, I mean, seriously, knowing God through Christ, mm -hmm. there is no greater joy mm -hmm. that, I, that I have found in life. And this is what, this is what Christians have been saying for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. It's not just, I believe ideas, it's, I, I, I have encountered, I am, mm -hmm. I have encountered God mm -hmm. through Christ, mm -hmm. and it becomes the central feature of your life. It becomes the thing that guides all else and the yeah. thing uh, that elevates every other experience. Everything else mm -hmm. is infused with the meaning mm -hmm. through the knowledge of, of God. And that's what I desire for the, the mm -hmm. seeker skeptic that listens to these mm -hmm. conversations is you can actually encounter God, and when you do, you're getting a taste of glory of, of the future glory that we all will partake of mm -hmm. in Christ for eternity. So anyway, that, that, that's the setup. I want to dig into the Old Testament a little okay. bit. Sure. We, we want to do this in a little bit more of a systematic way, I think, than what I've seen on some other conversations that you've had where it kind of feels like it's just bouncing like way all over the place. It's kind of like, what are the big ones? And it's like, you know, kind of doing flybys. I think what would be awesome to transition into the Old Testament is if you can elucidate for myself and also the audience listening, um, are there some broad principles that are helpful to bear in mind as you look at the books of the Old Testament? And so what are some tools that as we dig into this conversation are good to be aware of broadly speaking? Right. Well, I think one major pitfall uh, that a lot of people encounter is that the ancient Near Eastern world, the world of the Old Testament, 
seem so strange. You know, you have these taboos related to blood and to semen, and uh, you know, you have purity uh, laws and pollution, and uh, and you're just wondering. I don't get this sort of a thing. It just seems so foreign to us, a, a, a world of sacrifices and so forth. We just don't relate to that today. We value freedom. We value individualism. Uh, in the ancient Near East, there's a value placed on security, uh, on order and so forth, which can be in great conflict with, with how we look at the world uh, in our, through our Western lens. So I think just appreciating some of those things from the ancient Near East will be helpful rather than just rejecting it because it's different from ours saying, I want to understand this world, uh, which mean, requires patience, requires charity, where you say, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt here rather than just simply rushing to judgment. You know, sometimes it's a translational issue too. So keeping in mind their translation problems that, uh, you know, when, when someone reads a modern translation, which is different from a lot of older translations in English, uh, where the term slave is used, mm. a lot of people immediately think, oh, slave, that's bad. That is something that is like the uh, antebellum South. Mm -hmm. Well, when you, it, it's, it's, it's a poor translation, unfortunately, when you look at the Old Testament, that it should be something like worker or servant. And it could be, it's a neutral term. It, it can be something that is, you could be, you know, Joshua, Moses, they're called the servant of the Lord, the Ebed Adonai. It's a, it's, it can be an honorific title. Uh, and so rather than seeing it as something degrading where, where the, uh, the person who has charge or you know, is employing this uh, servant you know, can do whatever he wants with him. Mm -hmm. Which and so that kind of emotional baggage often comes with translational issues. Or the term "quote utterly destroy." Uh, some some of our translations have well. Sometimes it just means exile. People aren't necessarily killed. Uh, that it could just simply mean a decisive victory in battle without talking about any sort of uh, annihilation. It, it's kind of like ancient. Near Eastern trash talk. There's hyperbole, there's exaggeration, which is common in Egyptian, Assyrian accounts and so forth. And the Bible picks up on that. Uh, you know, so that's helpful to know. There's hyperbole, there's exaggeration. So looking at not just the ancient Near Eastern background and trying to appreciate it for what it is, uh, but also understanding that there are some translational issues, some, some words that can mislead as we read modern translations. Uh, so that's, that's another factor in, involved here. Uh, you also look in terms of, yes, you say verses, and you say, oh, that verse really looks troubling to me. But context, just biblical context itself can be very helpful. So think about the category of, you know, quote, utterly destroy. If it really means utterly destroy, why does the Bible mention in maybe the same chapter or later on in the book, the same book, that there are lots of survivors, that you, the same place that has been, quote, utterly destroyed, that also, you know, you have survivors that, that show mm. up later on. So it must mean something more than that. What, what does the context actually show us? Mm. It's charitable to, to say, well, how does this fit in with what is being said earlier? Like in Leviticus 25, it says you can, you know, you can acquire foreign servants just as you can actually acquire an Israelite servant. Uh, later on in, in Leviticus 25, it says that. But people say, ah, you can acquire a foreign servant. Mm. That's bad. Well, it just says in chapter 19 that you are to love the foreigner, the alien mm. in your midst, that you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And the same law that applies to the natives also applies to the foreigners in their midst. So you th see throughout the law of Moses, 36 times that you too were once foreigners, aliens in the land of Egypt. So look out for the alien in your midst, the, you know, those who are most vulnerable, the alien, the widow, the orphan, look out for them. So it, are you going to give the benefit of the doubt to the broader sweep of this looking out for the vulnerable, the marginalized, which is so thoroughly what the God of the Old Testament is doing. So there is this broader understanding, and it's important to, again, to exercise that kind of charitability toward the, you know, toward the broader context, rather than just focusing on this individual verse here or there. There's a potential for misunderstanding. And so uh, looking at the broader context uh, you know, of the ancient Near East, trying to appreciate it for what it is, uh, understanding the way in which language is used, maybe in translations that aren't so great, uh, and also looking at the broader context, I think will be very helpful, uh, recognizing that uh, there's, there's something going on in the bigger picture than in that particular individual verse that some people are focusing on and harping on. So those are a few things that I think are important as we unpack these texts 
to uh, kind of dig in more deeply and, and see that there is more going on. Let me give an example of how this actually played out in someone's life. Uh, someone came up to me at a conference and she's an Old Testament scholar and she said that she's in the middle of her studies in Old Testament and a lot of these heavy severe sounding texts were really weighing her down and she felt like quitting her Old Testament studies. And she read my book is God Armal Monster. And she said, I have some tools here that I can work with that really encourage me, that really help me to see a lot of the background context for understanding these biblical texts and went on to complete her PhD and is an author and so forth. But it was that book that really helped her to overcome a number of those hurdles to see, oh, let me take a look at the bigger picture and see what's going on here and address some of those things that a lot of people don't delve into. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that this clears up all the questions, mm -hmm. uh, but, but on the other hand, it does actually bring a lot of clarity to some of those issues that nag at people that that, that they find troubling. Yeah, that's that's really that's really a good overview. Uh, the first one thing I want to I think circle back to is when you were talking a little bit about slavery. Are you familiar like the way that the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians right. as compared to the way that the within within Israel this all took place? Mm -hmm. To me, I that's that's always a question I've had because. And that's something I've also seen online where at least <laughs> my understanding of the way in which the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians mm -hmm. was very uh, forced labor. It was very brutal and and not too dissimilar from like American shadow slavery. I'm sure there's actually a lot of differences, but also like basically not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I, I guess what I'm saying is do you, tell me a little bit more about slavery in that time period and, and because I think that that's helpful. Like, yeah. and I'm, I'm sort of, the question is a little bit leading, but at the same time, I really don't know the answer mm -hmm. uh, that much about right. these things. Yeah, yeah. Well, in my book is God of Indictive Bully, I have a, a couple of chapters that actually look at the worldview differences between the law, just the laws contained in the law of Moses and those within other ancient Near Eastern law collections, the worldview differences are amazing. There's a fundamental equality, for example, within the land of Israel, as opposed to these other cultures surrounding Israel that had a very hierarchical structure. And so the people at the bottom often got taken advantage of, punishments against them were more severe than if you're part of the nobility, part of the elite. And so there is no you know, one law to rule them all. Uh, whereas in Israel, this is much different. People made in the image of God and so forth. But, uh, but when it comes to the matter of servitude, well, yes, you know, and this illustrates my point that you can have the term servitude uh, or you know, servant or, quote, slavery uh, referring to something very negative. So it just depends on the context that servitude in Egypt was harsh and oppressive, and so the cries of the Israelites come up to God, as it were, and so he addresses their, uh, their concern and delivers them from Egypt. But it's interesting that, that the Lord tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, he says, let my people go that they may do what? Serve me in the wilderness. They're going from one servitude, which is negative, hmm. to another servitude, which is positive, which is liberating, which is freeing. And so it just illustrates the fact that this can be a term that, depending upon the context, is either negative, positive, or perhaps neutral. So, so we just have to look at that. So it's not as though there's something inherent in that word, quote, servant, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes unfortunately translated slave, that uh, gives us the, the you know, the, uh, kind of a negative meaning, mm -hmm. but there's something that's going on uh, beyond this very point. Uh, so there's also the, you know, the fact that when you look at the laws surrounding servitude in other cultures, surrounding Israel, you'll have like high interest loans for people to pay because they're in poverty. And so it just keeps people further down in poverty. There are no provisions for those who are impoverished to better themselves, to help come out of uh, poverty. But in Israel, of course, what leads people into servitude is because they are poor because they have no means. And so the Israelite laws say, don't charge interest to those who are poor. Uh, don't, you know, don't keep them further down. Don't keep them in poverty. Help them to come out of poverty. Uh, you have gleaning laws, for example, that you can pick 
from the fields uh, you know, of, of those who have crops that you're not to clear everything out or pluck everything from the trees, but let the poor of the land come. Mm. And, you know, of course, they got, and they've got to work for their food. So they've got to harvest, like in the book of Ruth, where she's harvesting grain and so forth. She's putting in the work. And so you have these sorts of provisions. You have you know, term limits to how long you can keep someone who is c a contracted worker for you, a, quote, servant, uh, you know, six years. And then you have to let that person go free with provisions so that person you know who has hired himself out uh, now is free to go has no lingering debt and so on so there is that kind of provision that you just don't have within other ancient near eastern cultures so there's something regulated within the law of moses that said you cannot keep them longer than this time and in fact there's even a provision for a servant to say hey this isn't a bad gig. I want to I, I want to live in my you know my employer's household for the rest of my life. And so there's a ceremony to uh, to indicate that. So a person's actually entering freely into mm -hmm. servitude rather than it being against that person's will. Mm -hmm. So so knowing that kind of a context, which is far different from the laws surrounding Israel, uh, yeah, that that can put things into proper perspective. So is it ideal? No, but there are th things that we see redemptive laws that are elevating above what's going on in the other cultures. And, you know, as Jesus said about even permitting divorce, you know, that it was permitted. Why? Because of the hardness of people's hearts, not because this is ideal. So mm -hmm. there are some arrangements that may not be ideal. It does make them immoral, but they just may be less than ideal uh, because it goes against the way that God designed things from the beginning, as you read Genesis 1 and 2. There's something, I think, that is hard for people to understand and being honest including myself about this idea of god working things out as a process mm -hmm. you know it's like you, something inside of you is like is it is it first of all it's like but what about the collateral damage during that time when things are mm -hmm. being worked out as a mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. i i understand the idea of um th this elevation or sort of incremental steps towards the higher ethic. But can you say maybe a little bit more about that in, in case someone has the same questions that I, I do within that? I'm, I know that God has good reasons mm -hmm. for allowing history to play itself out and that mm -hmm. he's he's achieving his purpose, but um, I just didn't know if you had any, yeah. any thoughts on that particular yeah. point. Yeah. Well, the Apostle Paul in Romans 7 talks about the law, the law of Moses, being good and spiritual and holy, hmm. that it is something that is a good provision, and that, as Deuteronomy says, this law is something that is to show the nations around, that if Israel is actually carrying out these laws, that they will say, what a wise and understanding people this is. So it's, it's actually to to stand out in contrast to the surrounding nations. So there is going to be that sort of a difference. Now, of course, any time God steps in to interact with human beings, he is going to interact with them at their level in the context in which uh, the these people find themselves. And so God is often accommodating himself, the word becoming flesh, dwelling among us, uh, enduring pain and, and hardship, uh, identifying with us, living under the law of Moses uh, during his lifetime. Uh, you know, and so you see that there is this accommodation that God brings as he enters into this context, the same thing in the Old Testament the people understood sacrifices the people understood certain uh, taboos and so on and so god is working within that kind of a system to uh, again elevate the the people and to uh, and to point them in a redemptive direction so god meets them halfway but it's it's far beyond what you see going on in other parts of the ancient near east you see god elevating the status of people women servants and so forth, uh, the, their humanity is taken for granted, that you see a, n a number of things that are being regulated because God assumes that people are going to sin. So if someone steals something from someone else, what are you, what are you to do? So God makes provision for those things. So it assumes a, a fallenness, and there are ways of regulating things in such a way that, uh, that, that uh, things don't get out of control. So rather than seeing the law as kind of the moral ceiling, Mm -hmm. Think of it as the kind of the moral floor that we're dealing with here, mm -hmm. that we're dealing with kind of basic concerns here that isn't giving to us a, say, a universal ethic for all time, but yet it is not as though it's immoral, but it's trying to bring 
people in a certain context where there are certain potential abuses given certain structures to uh, to step forward and to elevate and try to bring redemption to these people who are living this kind of a situation. For example, in Numbers 21, there are these daughters of Zelophehad who are protesting that the inheritance of their dead father should go to uncle so-and-so. Hmm. And they're saying, why shouldn't that come to us? And so Moses brings that to the Lord. The Lord says, yes, they should receive the inheritance. It shouldn't go to uncle so-and-so. And so you have even in this process a kind of dynamism where certain concerns are being addressed as Israel's history uh, is, 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 as it were, uh, you know, being developed. And so this is something that God is willing to, you know, accommodate and, and to modify given some of those less than ideal structures that are found within the ancient Near East. So th that's just an example of how that can, that can work. That's great. So by way of leading into, I think, future content that we hope to do, um, could you highlight a few of the big uh, pillars that we're kind of going to tackle? I think it would just be good for someone watching this and trying to figure out if what, what's coming down yeah. the pipe. You just maybe tell us a little bit about what these what are the big topics that we're going to yeah. get into? Yeah, I mean, I think three big topics are women, servitude, and warfare in the Old Testament. Those are big ones, and there are some texts that seem troubling to a lot of people, and, and I think just generally you know, believers, too, can be troubled by these. But hopefully as we delve in, we'll see some of these things uh, you know, having a broader context, and there's hyperbole, exaggeration, some other things that ought to be brought into consideration that would bring illumination. So, you know, women, servitude, and warfare. But even beyond some of those basic challenges, uh, things like how could God command Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? Or does a woman have to marry her rapist? Or are, you know, does the Bible permit war rape uh, when there's been warfare what is to be done with women and so forth so a lot of people think oh that the bible does permit that sort of a thing uh, or you know you you'll have other issues like kosher laws those are really strange you know that just seems so arbitrary and and odd uh, or what about some of those you know ceremonial laws perhaps or or what about those harsh punishments you know stoning burning is that actually literal and uh, and you know, be be prepared for a few surprises here as we as we unpack that and there's a lot more that i uh, address in 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 my books but uh, but we can unpack those as we go well i for one am greatly looking forward to it yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. It's going to be good.